Welcome to this Collateral Global Conversation. I'm Jenny Bristow, Senior Lecturer in Sociology at Canterbury Christ Church University, and I'm a member of the Collateral Global Editorial Board. My own research focuses on generations and education, and I've written several commentaries about the impact of lockdowns, school closures, and other COVID restrictions on young people, including a short book written with my teenage daughter in 2020, titled The Corona Generation, Coming of Age in a Crisis. Here, I'm delighted to talk to Professor Robert Dingwall about the role that sociology as a discipline can play in helping us to understand the UK's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and also where we could be doing better. Robert is not affiliated with Collateral Global. We're meeting today for the first time, and it's great to meet you, Robert. But his comments and articles from March 2020 onwards have been invaluable in raising important sociological questions and insights. So hello, Robert, and please could you start by telling us a bit about yourself and your work? OK, Jenny, well, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here talking with you. Um, I suppose the first thing to say is I have something like a 50-year career in sociology now, and it's strayed across um, sociology of medicine, the sociology of law, the sociology of science and technology. And the pandemic's really been a point at which all of those things have come together. But they're also united by a, an interest in work, organisations, occupations, and really going back to the first big project I worked on, which was agency decision-making child protection, where I became interested in the question of how institutions and organisations fail. And that introduced me to the work of a, uh, an engineer turned sociologist called Barry Turner, who'd written a study of the public inquiries into various sorts of disasters in the 1960s, and which was then sort of provided a theoretical framework for looking at uh, instances of social and organisational failure. And subsequently, I had the opportunity, rather randomly, I was, I got a, my first grant, my first travel grant to go to America on my own from a, an odd little programme at the US Embassy, landed me up in Denver, and I was really studying divorce mediation at the time. The Denver Sociology Department didn't quite know what to do with me and sent me out to lunch with a man called Tom Drabeck, who was one of the pioneers of the sociology of disasters in the States. And he took me to a country club, which was a very strange experience for a very young sociologist. And we talked about his work and it was absolutely fascinating. And I, I stayed with that. A little bit later, I had the opportunity to share an office with Diane Vaughan for three months while she was working on her study of the Challenger space disaster, uh, space shuttle disaster. Um, and uh, you know that's been a sort of continuing but low level interest in my career throughout, which uh, I suppose finally uh, became important in this context in some work on the 2003 heat wave in, uh, with colleagues in France, but also looking at the experience in the UK. And this sort of background of these sort of kind of low intent, slow breaking, um, but quite catastrophic uh, sorts of events that could hit societies. Uh, and we, we don't have too many natural disasters in this country. So the sociology of disasters is, has never been a big field. It's never really sort of taken off in the way it does in the States with hurricanes and tornadoes and massive floods and so on. Um, but I, I'd had this as a, a background interest. And then I got involved in a conversation on a hospital clinical ethics committee about the prospect of, a pan, of, a, of an influenza pandemic. This would be about... 2003, 2004, and it was picked up by Radio 4's Inside the Ethics Committee, and we prepared a broadcast version of this discussion, which happened to be heard by a civil servant at the Department of Health who was putting together a committee to look at the ethical aspects of the planning they were doing for pandemic influenza uh, around 2005, 2006. And she invited me to join that committee. And uh, I suppose that pretty much everything since has sort of built on that invitation because 
I found it such a fascinating topic and I recruited a number of PhD students to work on aspects of it. I had the opportunity to work for a while with Jonathan Van Tam who became Deputy Chief Medical Officer and was one of the leading figures in the, the research on influenza. Uh, and then of course, you know, I'm sort of thinking, well, how do I start preparing to retire in uh, 2020? I'm coming up for my 70th birthday and the pandemic hits and you, you sort of think, well, yes, it's a sort of culmination of a career interest. You can't really just sort of walk away from this. And, you know, you have maybe some responsibility to put something back into the community for all the years that you've, uh, the community has been sort of good to you. Um, by, by making that accumulation of knowledge and thinking and an understanding of what sociology might have to offer in a situation like this, uh, put it, put, putting that on the table for if people are interested or not, as the case may be. Yes, and it's, um, I mean, it's obviously a very unique historical moment, I suppose. And, um, I mean, the word that was used quite a lot was unprecedented. And what interests me is, given your historical knowledge of how societies have dealt with disasters and, the, and ways of thinking about things, I mean, how would you summarise the response to COVID? I mean, particularly in the UK, because... Well, the world's very big, but you know, looking at our response to society, was it what did you seem surprising about it, if anything, or or new compared to the way that societies might have responded to such a um, such a disaster previously? Well, it's certainly not unprecedented in in any sense. I mean, one of the things that's strongly influenced my analysis of the pandemic is some work that was done by my. Uh, actually, my PhD supervisor and great friend, Philip Strong, um, who was working at a history of the of the AIDS pandemic at the School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London in the, um, in the 1980s. And Phil wrote this paper, which was intended as the, as a sketch for a book about uh, which was based really on his historical studies of previous epidemics and pandemics from the from the Black Death onwards in the, in the 14th century uh, through to the AIDS pandemic of the uh, the 1980s, which is of course still just about with us. Um, and Phil came up with this scheme where he was pointing to the the way in which pandemics were this fundamental disruption of social order. And they went through a, a, a strongly recurrent pattern of, you know, an immediate moment of panic, uh, uh, the thought that the world as everybody had known it was coming to an end, which was then generating three societal pandemics, uh, a pandemic of fear, a pandemic of explanation and a pandemic of action which reflected the uncertainties and the insecurities. Um, but uh, in a fairly short order, people came to understand that the, you know, the pandemic was not the end of life as they knew it. It was a massive inconvenience, and they, but they found ways of living with it, working with it, um, having it settle into the background of everyday life. Uh, and that his argument was that this was a, a recurrent pattern um, and um, as such, it was the sort of thing that sociologists you know, should take an interest in and write about. Now, sadly, Phil died relatively young, I mean, just short of his 50th birthday, um, and never wrote the book. But the, the paper, I think, is absolutely seminal, and it's um, certainly done a lot to frame my understanding of, uh, of what we're living through now as something which has historical precedence and is following... It precisely the kind of pattern that uh, that Phil projected, with a few uh, a few unique and particular characteristics which reflect the particular infection and the particular society that we live in, uh, but where the the basic framework that he proposed thirty years ago is you know, is 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 still uh, a, it's still a point of orientation, shall I say, for any any sociologist coming to look at the pandemic.
so broadly speaking, thinking about how society kind of coped with COVID over the past couple of years, I mean, where do you think were the strengths and the weaknesses to the how how we how we managed? The problems lie in two two areas really. Um, the first, I would say, is the the failure to move on from the initial phase of panic, which is entirely understandable when you get a new uh, a newly emerged in, in infectious disease. Nobody knows if this is going to be the big one that will wipe out human life on this planet. But it became apparent pretty quickly that that was never going to be the case. I mean, even in February 2020, the World Health Organization report on the Wuhan outbreak was observing that 80% of the people who contracted COVID in the wild, the wild type, uh, the original Wuhan strain, uh, would never need to go near a hospital. Um, you know, people might be quite unwell, but they were not so unwell as to require hospitalisation. But we, and I think, in that context, that context of existential threat, you know, exceptional measures, um, what Agamben calls the state of exception, uh, you, you can understand why that might be appropriate, why that might be justifiable. The problem really has been moving on from that and doing anything, the way in which, if you like, the fear became perpetuated, the way in which the fear became to be adopted and managed, uh, adopted as a technique for managing populations uh, in, in a way that I think hadn't been the case before. I think if you look back to, uh, to 1918, if you look back to the outbreaks of bubonic plague before that, if you look at HIV AIDS, people come to accept that this is, this is a serious issue, but it's not the end of life on the planet, and that one moves towards a more proportionate kind of response as the, uh, as the infection works its way through the population. I mean, I mean, all pandemics come to an end with herd immunity. The only, the only political issue is how you get there. And you either get there through, if you're lucky, you get there with a vaccine. When we were doing pandemic influenza planning, we had high confidence that a vaccine would be available in six to nine months at scale because we know how to make influenza vaccines. Um, with a new infection, obviously, that is more uncertain. But you also get to, you should also be able to recognise in fairly short order that actually the, the risks of this infection are very strongly correlated with age and comorbidity uh, and that there is no virtue in uh, locking down a lot of the society in, in, order, to, uh, in order to prevent transmission, that you, you, know, you really need to think about how do we protect the vulnerable and how do we, um, as we did, uh, ultimately distribute the vaccines uh, according to some assessment of risk. Uh, I think the UK did a pretty good job on that. Uh, uh, what it did not do was to really deal with the sort of proportionality of the risk management and the, you know, the tolerability of risks. And that, in a sense, it it was because I think too much weight was giving, being given to some of the, the sort of biomedical voices and that uh, perhaps there wasn't sufficient thought about the, if you like, the balance of responsibility between the medical and the political and the, at, at, the, at appropriate times early on. To some extent, I think the politicians just shared the same panic as everybody else. Um, and maybe got carried away by their, you know, their own fears and anxieties. Although maybe not if you believe the accounts of the parties in Downing Street. Yes, I mean, it's, I think this, this question of fear is really interesting because there seem to be so many layers to it, all of which are sociologically fascinating. So the question of fear itself, and as you've indicated, I mean, it, it seems to be a fairly normal reaction mm -hmm. of a uh, society confronted with a new respiratory virus, um, sorry, respiratory infection, um, to be scared. And, and 
you know, my, my feeling of this has always been, well, that is actually quite helpful because it's that fear that leads people to behave in certain ways that would limit the spread of the infection. So there's that, that element of you know, fear initially, but then there's been a lot of discussion about the kind of promotion and almost politicisation of fear um, through the COVID pandemic, which does seem to me to go beyond um, what you might expect looking back historically at, at, at pandemic management. I mean, I do remember growing up in, uh, in the AIDS pandemic. I was quite a young teenager at the time in the mid 80s. And um, this, uh, I remember the tombstone adverts and I remember very clearly getting the message from school and every, everywhere you look, you know, teenage magazines, everything else, you know, if you have unprotected sex, you will die, <laughs> you know. And so, I mean, I remember that being very frightening. But at the same time, I think that it's, it's been noted that that message was kind of, yes, it was used partly to reinforce a, a particular kind of message, moralising message to young people about not having too much sex, I guess. It wasn't as all-encompassing as the kind of messaging that we had with uh, COVID, where there you know, seems to be a very well-documented attempt almost to sort of say we have to over-scare people in order to make them behave themselves which has then had a host of quite negative and unintended consequences. And I just wondered what your reflections were on that. Well, I do think it's an important difference. I mean, with the, with, I mean, with those AIDS campaigns that you recall, I mean, they were quite short-lived because the, the chief medical officer of the day banned them from, from, from running any longer. I mean, the tombstone ads... Um, the the agents the ad agency that put them together came back with further proposals for you know for more scary ads and the the cmo of the time said you know this is just not ethical this is not what public health does i'm you know we're not having any more of them you know we will educate people we won't scare them uh, and the you know the whole focus of the of the aids campaign shifted in, in that respect what I think is, we've seen here is the, I think we've got to be quite careful. I mean, there's a sort of simple version of it that is blaming the, the external behavioural science committee, SPY B, for, for a lot of this. And I, I think much more of it is coming from the, the sort of much more shadowy behavioural insights team you know, who've got an association with governments going back for... I suppose the last years of the Blair government, and the, you know, the interest in trying to manage populations by means of psychological techniques, the so-called nudging. Uh, I mean, Lucy Eastope writes about it in her book about the, you know, the decline of disaster management and the hollowing out of the the UK's emergency management capacity since 2010, and the, you know, the idea that. You know, we won't have professionals to manage you know, things like you know, floods or terrorist disasters. You know, we, we will have behavioural scientists who will nudge people into behaving in the right way. Um, so I, I think there is some kind of shift going on there, but I'm, I'm a little bit cautious about where I would allocate responsibility for that. Uh, I mean, clearly there has been an element of behavioural science that hasn't asked too many questions about about the ends as opposed to the means uh, and, and which hasn't which has really just sort of seen itself as a as, as a serving a customer and the, you know the customer is saying get you know get people to do this but we're not terribly worried how you get them to do it uh, and I, I and maybe that sort of ethical sensibility that um, Donald Ages and the Chief Medical Officer of the day in the 80s had, you know, it's, it's a somewhat declined. Um, I mean, Aitchison actually was a CMO who was also notably sympathetic to sociologists. He'd had a, quite a long history of working with, with medical sociologists and um, bringing, their, bringing their expertise into the, the work of the Department of Health. And again, again, I think that's something that's sort of changed a good deal in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, 
But I, I, th I think clearly this issue of the fear-based campaigning um, and, and the lack of appropriate checks on that, or indeed the idea that we might this year have gone it, put it into reverse, um, if you like, a, a reinvention of eat out to help out, um, <laughs> which again has, has sort of been... I mean, it was a brilliant campaign. It was a brilliant idea. And I, I think it's been really very unfairly blamed mm. because it, it it seemed to lead to some modest increases in transmission. But again, you've got to say, well, you know, transmission of what? Mm. Uh, you know, d you know d is it responsible for producing a lot of extra hospitalizations or deaths as opposed to a lot more minor infections that made people feel a bit bad for a few days? but which did a great deal to sustain a key economic sector, mm. such that it is actually in some sort of shape, you know, to, you know, to come out of the crisis. Yes, I mean, I think that is very interesting about Eat Out to Help Out. And I think the, um, that campaign and the, um, the, the, the behavioural science kind of you know, fear campaign, informed fear campaign, I think in a way you, you could see them as two versions of a similar uh, thing, which is the idea that um, you know, official messaging needs to get into the psyche mm. of the citizens, mm. <laughs> you know, and that idea of people need to be told how to feel. And I think that to me was one of the kind of disturbing things about it. I, I agree with you that it's become quite fashionable to blame Spy B for their mm. infamous kind of minutes from whatever committee meeting it was, where they did say, yes, we need to increase the level of fear. Um, but it wasn't as straightforward as that, was it? I mean, it, all of that messaging was developed within this wider, what, what people have called a, a culture of fear, a, a real kind of um, sense of being attuned to kind of wider risks in this very free-floating way um, that I think provided that very conducive environment for people also to be scaring themselves and be very, very susceptible to risk messaging, which you wouldn't necessarily have had a few decades ago. Um, and I, I think that also that, that idea that you kind of look to the government to tell you how to feel about everything seems to me to be, I'm not sure, you know, my grandparents' generation would have known what to do with that idea. Whereas these days we seem to be kind of quite accepting of the idea that we just should, if, if this makes sense, that we should just sort of ask governments to tell us how to feel. Yes, I think to some extent it reflects, I think, a better understanding of the limits of, or, or not a better understanding, a particular understanding of the limits of state action. That, And again, there's something that sociologists have known for a long time. Rules are not self-interpreting, they're not self-enforcing. Um, you know, you put rule, you you pass a set of regulations and people, people, people will make sense of them in their own terms. I mean, they will pick and mix and they will say, you know, as the ethnomethodologists have long pointed out, there's always an etc. clause in, in, in a rule about you know, how you interpret it and apply it to any particular situation. And to some extent, the, the behavioural science stuff is a way to get round that um, and to to try to ensure that, if you like, rules rules are enforced out of the, their, their sort of emotional embedding rather than depending on enforcement agents, you know, the, that actually you cannot have armies of police officers, you cannot have armies of other kinds of state agents going around making citizens behave in particular ways. Uh, but what you can do is to try to get into the heads of the citizens such that they can't think of behaving in any other way than, than you would wish them to, which again rests rest on a sort of fundamental fallacy about uh, the extent to which, again, any kind of general campaign can really influence behaviour in specific situations. Uh, and I think there, there's some interesting work by... Jed Mears and colleagues at York Law School on what they call the crea what sociology of law calls creative compliance. You know the idea that you know people look at rules and you know make, try to make sense of them mm. as they apply in their own situation, 
uh, and you know, can always find exceptions. We saw that a lot during the pandemic, didn't we? And I think the, um, um, I thought it was it was quite interesting that you you have on the one hand this sort of. Um, well, I, I actually remember it from the press briefings. The journalist that kept asking, well, what about this specific case? What about this specific mm. case? He ended up with this massively complicated mm. rule book yeah. uh, where every little thing that you could do was sort of laid down. And then when the way that people interpreted the rules was, I mean, it was kind of quite interesting. People who were very into following the rules, mm. um, but they interpreted them in a way that made sense to them. Mm. And could be very judgmental of people who'd interpreted the rules in a way that made sense to them. And so you end up with something that looks like a set of rules, but mm. it actually it isn't. It's a way of people kind of, I suppose, finding a way of um, um, justifying their own actions, I suppose, in something that makes their life livable. Yeah, um, which is not an idea that sociologists are unfamiliar with. No. <laughs> um, I mean, I think there was an issue at the press conferences that, by and large, the journalists who went to them were the political reporters, not the science and medical reporters. Mm -hmm. And that did affect the kind of quality of the questions that were, were asked. Uh, but I, I think beyond that, I mean, the rules, yes, they proliferated, they became unintelligible. Their impact was largely as, as something that was overlaid on existing social conflicts. I mean, here in Nottingham, we saw a, a lot of use of the rules to uh, pursue previously existing conflicts between students and um, other residents in the neighbourhoods where there's a lot of um, rental housing let to students. Uh, and we've had all these years of conflict where the, you know, the students don't put the... Um, uh, don't put the rubbish out on the right days and they have these parties and they don't look after the gardens and uh, every summer there's a pile of abandoned mattresses and stuff um, that the council has to clear away and you know here's a new tool for the new, for the neighbours to pursue their grievances with they mm. you know they can ring up the um, ring up the local police and say well there's you know there's half a dozen students got together and they're all breaking the rules and the yeah, you know, the police response is eventually, you know, to to say, well, what do you really want us to do about it? Mm. Um, you know, there's a few high-profile symbolic fines. You know, the universities get dragged in. Um, you know, you get sort of university discipline being applied. But I mean, in fairly short order, there's not much appetite for pursuing any of this stuff. You know, the you know the police have got better things to do on a Saturday night. Than to go around issuing fixed penalty students, uh, fixed penalty tickets to students. Yes. No, and I suppose it was very interesting at that time where often it took the form of, um, is it law, is it guidance, that kind of thing. Mm. I'm thinking about the, the role of convention in all of this and, and yeah, performativity, moralisation, all of that where you, you would have... Um, well, I, I suppose when I think back on it, that there were quite distinct phases. I can't remember exact the exact dates, but you know, initially people were generally, genuinely quite scared and mm. thought, right, staying at home is the right thing to do. And then there started to be a sense of, you know, well, it's now we can go out and and those kind of things. And, and but there was still a real tension between those who felt that uh, we still needed to sort of stay put and this demand to be told what to do. And then around the edges, a kind of a loosening of attitudes. And then I think probably from after July 2020, it all got a lot more messy, mm -hmm. really. You had different groups of people making their own decisions. You had um, you know, institutions like schools and universities being bashed this way, that way, you know, <laughs> told what to do. But then it wasn't as kind of coherent so I, I I suppose my experience of it was was this very kind of contradictory one where on the one hand you you feel like there's um a real pressure to behave in in certain ways and you know I think the law is important I think even if the police don't enforce it it is important when you've got laws that are kind of micro regulating your everyday life um but at the same time you, it, it seemed to sort of, the, the cracks showed quite quickly, which I suppose is 
a familiar, it falls into a fairly familiar pattern of the times that we live in, doesn't it? That we do live in quite an individuated society where people aren't necessarily, you know, uh, they don't necessarily obey community conventions in the way that previously well, they, they, well, they would have. Well, they never did. I mean, the, okay. <laughs> um, I think, again, it's perhaps one of these things where, you know, a little bit more historical perspective is, is, is helpful. Um, I think that we, we may have been through a 20th century, which was more, I suppose, um, compliant than, you know, the, 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 the more, that than would have been the case in earlier generations, but it, I mean, if you look back at the history of the, particularly of the English, you know, you can go right back to the 13th century, and you can, um, I mean, Alan McFarlane's work you know, traces this. Um, you know, the, the English have always been a more individualist sort of uh, sort of culture than you know the, the, the many other countries. Um, and when I say English, I mean I would be sort of reaching up to lowland Scotland. I mean the, you know, the, the Scottish Enlightenment of the 18th century, where a lot of the implications of individualist thinking are explored. I mean the, you know, people like Adam Smith thought of themselves as North Britons. You know, the Scots were those people behind that beyond the Highland line. You know, who'd been in rebellion in 1715 and 1745, and you know they were the real barbarians. So people like Smith and Hume and their contemporaries, they'd go to elocution lessons in Edinburgh to mitigate their Scottish accents. And, you know, their, their whole orientation was, was south of the border. Um, and eventually when higher education begins to change in England, you know, the you know, university college recruits a lot of its first professors from Scotland uh, and, and sort of brings this sort of tradition southwards. So I think it's a much more co complex issue. Um, you know, it's like the idea, I mean, I used to work in soci sociology of the family a bit, and, you know, the idea of the nuclear family as, as, as the sort of you know, long-term marriage with 2.4 children, very much a 20th century thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, prior to that, it was, you know, marriage was often very informal until the, well, for much of the population, until the 1830s, and it, only became formalised so that the state could find out who, who a father was and, you know, pursue him to pay for his kids. Um, and you get this, uh, but uh, I mean, marriage, there's still a lot of, of, there's still a lot of informal marriage or cohabitation right through to World War, the World War One. I. I mean, it becomes a major issue for paying widows' pensions at the end of the war, is identifying the widows because so many of them are de facto rather than de jure. Um, I mean, it, it, one of the things we did suffer from in the pandemic was really the lack of capacity in the sociology of law in this country, which was stimulated a good bit in the 1980s. It was how I got into it, but it, it's a very small field in sociology. But all these issues about rules and compliance and you know, sort of how you do effective rulemaking What's the basis of legitimacy for rules? I mean, one of the problems increasingly has been the lack of a scientific base for, for many of the actions that citizens are being asked to undertake. Yes. Uh, and that then throws into doubt the legitimacy of any rule requiring compliance with, uh, with that action. Uh, now, that's a very familiar kind of problem in, in, in law and society studies. I mean, if you go to the States, Sociology of law is a medium-sized field within the American Sociological Association. The section has about half the membership of the, of the medical sociology section, but that still makes it a pretty four or five hundred people. Um, in the UK, you could count the number of sociologists of law on the fingers of one hand, and most of them are my contemporaries. Mm -hmm. And they will, you know, we will be gone. Um, but that's an, you know that's a source of expertise that was that never really featured in pandemic management, and so we end up with laws that are being drafted on the basis of, if you like, the rational scientific advice, rather than an understanding of this is what you can actually do with law, 
Mm. And this is how laws work. And this is what you need to found laws on for them to be legitimate. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot to unpack in that, isn't there? I mean, mm. there has been some discussion about uh, what some people call scientism in relation to this, which is not only come up in relation to the pandemic, but increasingly in other areas of policy making, um, where you, you have kind of ideas about what should be done that are kind of dressed in the language of science um, and presented as though they are kind of, they come out of a lab. Whereas in fact they are, I, yeah, they're actually ideas about what should happen with um, society. You've got the question of trust, which I think is a very interesting one. I suppose one of the things that I noted, but you may not think that this is as new as I think it is, that yeah, we, we've lived in for a while in a society that people say is, is a society of kind of declining trust. I mean, particularly between citizens and politicians and media and, and all of that. Um, but there did seem to be a kind of lack of trust in all directions um, that gave rise to the, the demand for you know, new rules in the sense that uh, there seemed to be an assumption from the top that unless people were told exactly what they couldn't do, they would go and do it. And then an assumption from below, if you like, from you know, everyday citizens that um, um, the, well, it, it was, I suppose, the, the role of the government to create all of these kind of you know, new, new laws, but also a kind of a lack of belief in them. And I found that very interesting, that the interplay between all of those things. Yeah, well, <clears throat> where to start? I mean, I think there is a particular issue which is to some extent connected with the nature of the UK as a class society about trust between citizens and elites. And I think it's, I, I used to probably use elites as a more general term than government. Um, I mean, certainly thought to have been one of the features of the relative success of the, uh, of the Nordic countries in dealing with the pandemic is the, the high degree of trust between citizens and, and, and government, which comes at a cost. I mean, that, uh, I mean, sweet, uh, friends in Sweden occasionally complain about the, the, pressure, the pressure to conform that it, you know, being a country that doesn't like tall poppies, uh, so that you know, scientific excellence, innovation, um, things that we you know, that might make might lead somebody to stand out from the crowd are, are, are not valued uh, in the way that they might be in a more differentiated society like ours. But there is clearly you have. Um, uh, a much less, uh, a much more egalitarian society, at least in theory. Um, although it's interesting that the coverage of Sweden, for example, doesn't tends to be focused on Stockholm and inner Stockholm and the nice places that journalisms go to, rather than, you know, the the sort of ethnic diversity of cities like Malmo or Gothenburg. Um, but. Uh, I mean, all, con all contemporary societies, all modern societies rest on trust. I mean, Zimmel was pointing this out um, more than 100 years ago now, that, you know, we have to trust all sorts of institutions. We have to trust all sorts of, in you know, there's all sorts of things we can't verify for ourselves. You know, when, when Adam Smith wrote about, you know, customer customer sanctions being the most important thing. You know, he was thinking of very small scale societies and if the baker sold you moldy bread and you didn't go and buy the bread from the baker, the baker would go out of business. You know, now the baker is a sort of factory 200 miles away, you know, supplying thousands of shops and that kind of consumer power has, you know, is, is considerably weakened and you have to depend on other institutions. And it's a theme, great theme in classic sociology is, is about how you produce that level of trust in, in, in uh, you know, to sort of, to replace the kind of immediate relationships that you might have had in more traditional societies. But I, I think that what we've seen with the, with the pandemic, if you like, is the, the erosion of, the partial erosion of that as 
as something between citizens and, and government, in part because government has, you know, government continued the emergency legislation and the emergency response in ways that no emergency planner would actually advocate. That there are the things that you will, there are other things that are, are appropriate for an existential threat. And there are the things which are appropriate for a much longer term, if you like, management of the transition to COVID as an endemic infection. Mm. And you know, the pathway to herd immunity through the, the mixture of vaccination and uh, a natural infection. And you know, how you combine those and manage them and how you don't make the sort of false promises that the Chinese are making, for example, you know, the party will eliminate COVID. You know, this is a fantasy. Zero COVID always was a fantasy. Uh, but in order to achieve that, I mean, you simply, you, I mean, you do need a more collaborative approach by governments. You need something that exposes, explains more of the uncertainties, that discusses the trade-offs and the tolerability of risks. And which, which gets a proper balance between the scientific input and the political judgments. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the scientific input is is very important to inform those judgments. But you know, the science doesn't tell you what is a tolerable risk. A tolerable risk is a political judgment. It's a value judgment. It's one that any of us is competent to join in debating. Um, the scientists can inform that debate. But they, you know, it's not appropriate for them to, to take it over, particularly when you've, you're, you're looking at the issues of trade-offs. That, and again, quite a lot of the, quite a lot of the naivety of the zero COVID school rests on the assumption, on its neglect of the economy and the economic issues, and the fact that our lifestyle has to be paid for, and you know, the, the government does. The government generally does not have a magic money tree. I started out as, as an economist uh, in my first year at university and um, sometimes used to joke with, with my colleagues that I was the last Keynesian left on the campus. But um, I think the, 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 the idea that you have to worry about the resources and you... Again, you, there are things that you can do in a short-term emergency, and there are things that you, in the long term, you have to make a transition to a society that is not organised around the elimination of infection. Mm. It's you know managing infection in a proportionate way is as good as it gets. Well, that's right. You can't see policy as just looking at this one very you know, very particular area mm. because you need to look at the effects that, on everything else. Um, I think education is instructive in, yeah. in this regard. I mean, that you would just sort of pretty much abandon education for two years yeah. um, because of the focus on this particular emergency. And, and the, the short-termism as well, I think, is interesting because, I mean, just to go back, back a bit to eat out, to help mm. out and you know, this kind of attempt to try and get people back to work, yeah. which doesn't seem to be going very well in certain institutions. Of course, a, lot, a large section of the population have always been at work as well. That's the yes, other contradiction yeah. of the whole thing. But there seems to be this, this, this problem, which, um, you know, I'm surprised wasn't anticipated, that if you unleash this level of fear or if you unleash a particular focus on a particular thing and you become wedded to that... Mm then it's very difficult to row back from it, isn't it? Mm. And it's not like you can just click your fingers and say, OK, it's all over now, back to work. Yeah. Well, and there is also, there is also yes, there's also this proportionality issue that, I mean, I've certainly seen arguments, and I, I think this is something that the epidemiologists will be debating among themselves for years, that you may end up with more deaths from the collateral damage than you do from the um, the infection itself. Mm. Um, when you take account of the delayed treatments for cardiac conditions, cancers and so on, when you deal with the, the sort of legacy of so-called deaths of despair, which, as we saw in during the 1980s from 
you know, from the economic and social disruption that's been caused. Um, you know, we may in, in the short term have this, this employment boom, but that seems to be tied up with a lot of people actually leaving the workforce. Uh, and that's the problem, that's the issue around the labour shortages. Um, and I, I, I think I, it will be very interesting to see how the sums look 10 years down the track uh, in terms of what are, you know, who has, where have the deaths come? Um, you know, where are the excess deaths? But there, you know, there is certainly this issue of the fixation on a single, uh, a single outcome measure, um, rather than thinking about, you know, to what extent are the COVID deaths displaced deaths? You know that these are deaths that were not caused this year by influenza. I mean, we've had, we've had ten years of falling deaths from influenza. Um, I mean, death rates generally have been falling since around two thousand, and what the pandemic years did was to sort of take it back to something around the level of 1999-2001. So again, it's putting that kind of notion of a catastrophe into proportion, that if you've got a historical sensibility, you know this is not a big pandemic. You know, it doesn't begin to compare with the death rates of 1918. It certainly doesn't compare with the bubonic plague death rates of... Uh, of the Black Death, of the Plague of Justinian before that, um, or the the fourth cent- uh, the fifth century BCE and the you know the Great Plague of Athens, whatever caused that, and, and nobody quite knows. But where you're talking about death rates of thirty to fifty percent of the population, and you know, COVID was never going to be that lethal. Mm. You wrote a, a, a very interesting blog for the British Sociological Association um, a few months ago now, I think it was, uh, where you, you talked about the project of sociology and um, you know, how it has sort of become detached from its roots, if you like, in, in, and that, that was evident during the pandemic. I wondered if you could just sort of tell us a little bit about that. Well, I suppose if we go back to what I was saying about, um, about Phil Strong's analysis... And he's saying, look, you know, what a pandemic does is to disrupt the order of the society that we all thought we lived in. And the problem of order is centrally what sociology has always been about. I mean, all of the social sciences have their big question. You know, economists has uh, the, about the allocation of resources under scarcity, politics about power and legitimacy, you know, geography about space, psychology about the mind. You know, you, you, and, our, and our question is order. Mm. Um, and it's order at all levels. Um, and you, you might say it's about orderliness and it's also about, it's, it's also about justice and distribution. So, but there are questions about, like, how do how does societies balance stability and change uh, as well as how do they then, as it were, distribute the, 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 the consequences. And I think to some extent, the I suppose it's, it's my leanings towards ethnomethodology and conversation analysis, which are still very much engaged with these issues of orderliness. Um, how do we produce the... How do we carry out conversations you know, without disagreeing and arguing all the time. Um, how do we, and, and then moving on from there to think about the, you know, the, the institutions that we have, the way in which they, they conserve and the way the ways in which they change. And I, I do think a lot of contemporary sociology has become somewhat fixated on the, if you like, the second aspect of the question, which is what kind of order? Mm. Um, and, and looking at issues around identity, looking at issues around class, ethnicity, justice, social justice, which are important, but it seems to me that they are less fundamental than the question of how order itself is possible. How do we actually practically in the world de- avoid the sort of thought experiment that Thomas Hobbes carried out? You know, what would life be like without society? Well, it would be, oh, if I get it in the right order, you know, nasty, solitary, brutish and, and short. Um, 
you know, that you couldn't live in a world where, you know, there was no incentive to form relationships, there was no incentive to plant crops, because, you know, somebody would just come in and take them, there would be no restraint. Um, you know, you could make no investment for the future, nobody would want to have children, um, you know, the land would be de dominated by violence, conflict, rape, uh, you know, all of... People just, in a sense, pursuing their own goals, regardless of the the collective impact. And you know, sociology, if you like, is about finding answers to that question. You know, how is it that that is not the world? Mm. You know, that it for the most part that is not the world that we live in. Uh, you know, we do all sorts of things every day. You know, in an orderly fashion, we continue to reproduce, produce, and reproduce you know, that orderliness. Um, now, it has adverse consequences. It's maybe not the best world we could have. And, you know, an important part of sociology has always been the dream that we could come up with a better one. But an important part of the task is understanding the one that we have. Mm. Uh, and, yes, the argument of my paper was that, you know, of my blog was that we, um, we perhaps haven't have neglected that. Um, at the um, in pursuit of, of 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 other concerns, in a sense that as sociologists we become critics first and foremost, I suppose, rather than that that kind of more holistic sense of responsibility that I think uh, yeah. is associated more with the kind of classical sociology. Yes, I mean if I can. I can drop names from a moment. I mean, I had a conversation with, with Howard Becker about the politics of the Chicago School, and I was quoting to him Michael Oakeshott's description of, uh, of, 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 of a, what, what, what conservatism was really about, you know, about sort of you know, modest change based on evidence, carefully considered, you know, taking account of the, you know, the, the sort of wisdom of the past. Uh, and how, how he said, well, yes, I mean, that's what we thought we were on about. <laughs> and now, now, again, it's coming out of an American context yeah. where the, you know, the political distribution is, is very different. Um, but I, th I think there is, there is an authentic sociological tradition um, of, a, of, a, of a small C conservative kind. Um, I mean, there are also important points that people like uh, people like Hayek have raised about the sort of collectivist thinking that sociology tends to default towards, and the again we come back to these problems of trust, these problems of information. That if you're what we've seen in the pandemic is, if you like, a natural experiment in central planning, which has revealed the pro precisely the problems that Hayek identified in in his academic work, I mean, it's quite distinct. I mean, some of his political work is a bit iffy, but, I mean, some of the stuff he wrote about the price system and the way in which prices code information um, so that we don't have to... We don't have to have perfect knowledge of everything in the way that classical economics assumes. We have all these sort of shortcuts that allow us to place, place trust in the information that we're being given. Um, and, but Hayek's core argument is, look, you know, central planners cannot know the precise details of individuals' abilities, aspirations, and everyday lives. And that is a, you know, that is a constraint on what we can achieve by collective action. Mm. And that is something which sociologists need to take seriously and engage with. That's very interesting that you say that, because one of the things that I've been struck by is... Um... There seems to be some a fascination within some, among some sociologists, and not just sociologists, other branches of academia, with um, almost like the the, the the lockdown as utopia. Mm. You know, the, this idea of right, look, we can just remake society now mm. as we see it, and um, I've really struggled to understand where that's coming from, to be honest, because to me it goes, it runs at odds. 
with the central concerns that a lot of sociologists have about class inequalities and you know the, the, the global south and the you know the, the global north and the, the disparities between them where you, you know that seems to have been so stark in terms of who was who benefited from the lockdowns more and who, and who suffered disproportionately do you see what i mean i mean i think it's, it's quite an interesting question as to where does that sort of almost radical fascination come from with the, the, the notion of lockdown as utopia? Well, I mean, there is a utopian element to, to sociology. I mean, as I pointed out, I mean, there is, there is always the attempt to envision a better world than the one that we have. Um, and that is a strength of the discipline, it's a, and it's a virtue of the discipline. Um, I don't think there is a single utopia that sociologists can or should aspire to. Um, and I think, again, maybe we've, in this country at least, you know, we do have a, we don't perhaps have the diversity that you would find in the United States, the diverse, diversity of utopias, if I can put it that way. Um, partly because we're a much smaller academic community. Um, and there, there isn't perhaps quite the same opportunity to, um, you know, to sustain different, you know, diff different kinds of aspiration. Uh, although I think there's quite a lot of sociologists who just sort of keep their heads down and you know, sort of get on with everyday life uh, and, and don't aspire to take part in that. But again, the, you know, the Build Back Better, you know, it's a social movement. It deserves the same kind of analysis as any other social movement. Um, it's the promotion of a particular kind of class interest and it, uh, as such it should be analysed. Um, but it, that's it's not to say that it should be you know, taken, taken up as a, as a kind of collective programme. Mm. Um, you know, our job is not to pursue that. Our job is to understand it and, and to analyse it and to explicate it. In your blog for the um, British Sociological Association, you also talked about magical thinking in relation to discussions about the pandemic. Could you just say a bit about that? Well, it was, it's one of the things that sort of... I suppose it's the way in which you've had this very narrow base of science that's got in that, in contrast to the pandemic, plan, panic, pandemic influenza planning that I was involved in, the expectation in the early 2000s was that the pandemic would be managed by the um, civil emergencies unit in the cabinet office as a whole of science, whole of government kind of problem. Um, and for reasons which have, no, have not been made public, the the management of this pandemic fell into the hands of the Department of Health, which then, and since you had a, a chief medical officer and a chief scientific advisor who were both essentially biomedical scientists, you get the recruitment of a scientific advisory network that is almost entirely drawn from that world or from people associated with it. And it was, it's been very hard for other kinds of... Um, other kinds of expertise to get a to get a hearing. Um, so, for example, the very extensive literature on the social science of social distancing in the field of proxemics, which has been around since the 1950s, has, has really just not been taken up at all. I mean, we know a lot about social distancing, which bears very very little relationship to any of the policy statements that were made about it. Um, so there's been a kind of an assumption that the biomedical world has all the knowledge that is needed to manage a pandemic. And the, this has then sort of led to some very sort of curious thoughts that as, as they sort of reach out beyond that, you know, the, if you like, the distinctive expertise of the social sciences generally, not just sociology, has, has, has simply not been incorporated. Um, if, you look, if you take the issue of spy, the, group, the spy B group, for example, 
I mean, it's very much dominated by people with a background in health behaviour, which means that the sorts of questions that you're raising about education uh, and child development, I mean, there aren't people there who are constantly saying, what are we doing to the children of the, of the nation by the policies that we're investing in, uh, closing schools, you know, requiring children to wear masks, thinking about the impact on communication disorders, on um, you know, child, uh, the, the, the mental health of children, um, you know, the proportionality of those interventions. And I, I think that, but there, there is this, somehow this, this assumption that it's all right. Now, the specific example I've pursued on magical thinking really has been in relation to face coverings. Um, where you really have three types of evidence. I mean, you have stuff that comes out of experiments by engineers and physicists under lab conditions whose generalizability to the real world is very problematic, um, which do suggest that they might be modestly effective. You have what the public health world calls observational studies, which is quite different from what sociologists call observational studies, but essentially what naturally occurring statistics can we find mm. in different places at different times and how can we build these into some kind of statistical model that will enable us to compare contexts where there are face coverings and where there aren't face coverings, which basically is so vulnerable to cherry picking mm. uh, and confounding that I, I just don't, I just think that entire literature is worthless. And thirdly, you have the randomised controlled trials, which have always been regarded as the gold standard in evidence-based medicine, where you have 15 trials of masking prior to the pandemic, which show little or no benefit at a community level, um, where you've, you have two trials which are carried out during the pandemic, both of which have, have their flaws, but they produce results that are consistent with the previous 15 you know, of, of nil to minimal effect. Um, and, but, and, and, and yet you, you have very high level lab scientists, um, medi you know, biomedical advisors, confidently pronouncing masks work. You know, their own literature reviews tell them that it's weak evidence of, 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 of at best, a small benefit. Now, what you might be able to argue is that correctly used FP2 masks, you know, have some benefit as personal protection, and they may they may have value in people who are immunosuppressed. Um, although, again, you have to ask, well, what were these people doing in 2019? Um, and I, I mean, I've one point in my career I was doing some possible work on cystic, looking at possible work on cystic fibrosis and I remember talking to young people with that condition who told me about how they manage their risks in, in everyday activities. Um, you know, it's always been a risk, people have always managed it. Um, and, and COVID doesn't present an exceptional risk. Mm. Beyond that, you, you're, you're saying, well, okay, why are we imposing this on populations? And you're looking at expertise, which is experience of largely drawn from hospitals. Supermarkets, supermarkets have always good, had good ventilation systems because the supermarket owners don't want humans breathing gunge over the fruit and veg. Mm. Um, air, aircraft have always had high quality ventilation systems because people are worried about infectious disease transmission. Aircraft air is pretty much as clean as operating theatre air. Mm. Surgeons only ever wear masks to protect themselves from the sort of blood and, and other unpleasant substances that get sprayed over their faces when they're doing surgery. You know, you, if you've ever been in an operating theatre, you know, you nick an artery and you, 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 you don't want to get a mouthful of arterial blood. Or you're, 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 you're hacking away at a bone and the, you know, the rotary saw is, is throwing off fragments. Well, you, know, you don't really want those hitting your face if you can avoid it. Um, so I, I think you, you have these kind of confident pronouncements on what is obviously flimsy evidence. Mm. 
And, you know, what else do you call it but magical thinking? Yes. I think that, yeah, I think that's really true. And I think the, uh, the, uh, the masks issue, I mean, it is fascinating, you know, because it, it seems to play so many roles in relation to the, the, the way that we've been through this pandemic. Um, you know, very highly symbolic, obviously. So you, you have that sense of, you know, what, so what you're talking about, well, masks work very confidently, but then also, but they make people feel safe or they remind people that there's a pandemic on, or you know, there's one, well, you know, there's there's so many different arguments that actually come into play, um, where it, it seems like what, what you're saying seeing is a kind of a, a casting around often for a justification of a measure that's been put into place, and you know also the, that's gone along with that, um, which I've found you know, particularly striking in relation to children. Um, that this this idea that well it doesn't really matter whether they work or not we might as well just do it yeah which I think for, yeah for school children six eight hours a day in a mask is 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 clearly not right <laughs> yeah I mean that's not a, that's not a question of you know, scientifically does it keep particles out or not you just look at it as a human being you say but you need a high bar to want to put that in place and yet. That seems to have been the, the kind of the easiest thing almost that we've used. And I, I suspect it is because of the symbolic quality attached to mask wearing and the performance and the ritual of it. Which is where you then come back to the issues raised by the sociology of law mm. about the extent to which you can use, you, you can appropriately use law to, you know, to enforce those sorts of vague symbolic goals mm. rather than things that you, you know, will, will have a demonstrable benefit. Uh, I mean, we don't, we don't use health and safety law you know, for symbolic purposes. Uh, you know, we use it because you know, we use it in situations where we think it's going to be effective and it's going to make a difference. And it's actually going to, you know, it's demonstrably going to protect people from radiation, chemical exposures, um, the hazards of working at height and, and, and so on. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's fundamentally lacking and that's a, f a fundamental objection to the use of law. I, I mean, I also find myself disturbed by the, the sort of ableist thinking of a lot of the mask advocates that these are a low-cost, low-harm intervention. Well, for a very significant proportion of the population, they aren't. You know, there are neurodiverse people, there are people who... Uh, have communication di you know, disorders. There are people who have pre previous traumatic experiences. I mean, I, I had a very moving follow-up to a, a tweet I made about this from somebody who said, look, you know, for me, masks remind me of when I was in Bosnia during the war in the, uh, in the 90s. And the masks were worn by the gunman who came to my village and shot all the men. Mm. And, that, you know, and that is something that's evoked for me you know, when I see them in this. So it, mm. in a sense, it doesn't, you know, and when you begin to add those groups together, you're talking about, you know, maybe 15, 20% of the population. And then you're thinking about the damage that it's doing to child development in link language, mental health, um, uh, speech, uh, the, the sort of, you know, the interactional abilities of, of children. Um, you know, they're, they're, this is not a low bar intervention. Mm. Um, and, you know, questions have to be asked, and I hope they will be asked, about, you know, why governments around the world did not properly fund RCTs to find out the answers. Mm. Because those RCTs could have been done. Mm. You know, we could have randomly allocated schools in England to mask and no mask conditions. We could have had a, you know, a huge, you know, huge RCT. A very large scale RCT that would have given us definitive answers to a lot of questions. Mm. We never did it. We were very happy to throw money at, uh, no, well, throw money, invest money sensibly in the recovery trial to compare uh, various therapeutic interventions. Uh, you know, brilliant work. Um, you know, and you know, did an awful lot to sort of demonstrate what worked and what didn't in the therapeutic field, but. Somehow or other, the social interventions you know, simply just it was, was simply waved through. Yes, which 
again goes back to the sort of the short termism really doesn't it in the sense of if yeah we were to come out of this and say okay we will never do this again we won't make children wear masks or have lockdowns or use non-pharmaceutical interventions or use fear <laughs> yeah. um that to encourage compliance then okay you can say all right fine but i think it's unlikely i i, I don't think you know i think the next pandemic, you know, these things will be in the toolkit. They will probably come out again. And so, you know, it's very unfortunate that some of these things, you know, we went into this experiment, which could never be an experiment because you didn't have a control. And, you know, um, as you say, we, we, we didn't have any good evidence. And then we didn't collect any good evidence either, mm. which means that then what have we learned as a society going forwards? And, you know, that, that does seem to be... A shame. Yes, and I mean, I think it does respect. It does reflect something of the, you know, the disregard for the, you know, for the social sciences among you know, some pot, some sections of the policy elite at the moment. Mm. Um, and we have to ask ourselves to what extent we've contributed to that ourselves. But, um, but I, th I think unless these these sorts of questions get. Uh, addressed more seriously, both by social scientists, and I mean all social scientists, not just sociologists, um, and 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 by policy, uh, the policy communities. You know, we are just going to end up making the same mistakes next time round, uh, and that that is troubling. I I hope I shan't live long enough to see it. Um, you know, I'm as I say, I'd uh, really been hoping that I would. Uh, past my 70th birthday and spend more time with my grandchildren <laughs> and uh, my garden but uh, um, you know maybe those days will co you know, will come around uh, but um, you know for now I think the you know the important thing is you know to you know, to identify these questions and to make sure that you know there there is a there is a legacy of research and policy um, and that we, you know, we, we don't stumble into the same traps again, um, which is, you know, is, is a very present danger. And uh, I mean, I think that, you know, that is, oh, you know, when you've been a, when you've been a sociologist for 50 years, you, you, you've, you're very used to being ignored, but it, <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't necessarily mean that you were wrong. <laughs> no. <laughs> And I think from, from what you're saying, that certainly uh, those of us working in the social sciences and the policy field more broadly have, have a bit of job of work to do to kind of ensure that we're part of this conversation and the, this discussion moving mm. forwards. Yeah. So I think we'll uh, leave it there, Robert, although I'm sure we could go on for hours more. <laughs> um, thank you once again for um, talking to me today. That was absolutely fascinating. I imagine we'll see each other in the future as these issues keep rumbling on. Well, I very much hope so, and I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to uh, you know, to talk. At, as you rightly say, sociologists could talk for hours. Mm -hmm.